Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Devani. I'm really looking forward to my special guest, which I already had met him on a couple of times, Eric Kazen. As you know, I'm really, really uh, fascinating, brilliant mind. Uh, he just um, published his latest article, The Political Theology of Bitcoin. Check it out on cryptosovereignty.org. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And, you know, in times of this where, um, you know, where is systematic, uh, uh, shameless criminality going on, um, perpetrated and systematically, you know, stolen uh, from people, monetary debasement, monetary, you know, bailouts, um, printing or generating digital fiat money out of thin air, trillions, over trillions, over trillions. I wonder when we're ever going to talk about quadrillions as it seems like. And, you know, with all the corona pandemic going on and uh, uh, suppression, coercion, cover up, oppression, uh, the cry for more, you know, uh, state and nation state and government. And, you know, we got to ask ourselves, especially in these times, where does the nation state, the governments, the central banks derive its legitimacy from? And this is why I want to talk to Eric Kaysen about the, you know, the question of legitimacy, the, you know, the legal status, like, like when do we need to finally, you know, break this, as Eric Kaysen also calls it, the social contract called law. And so I'm really looking forward, without further ado, this is my talk with Eric Kaysen. Let me know if you have any questions and give us a follow, give me a follow on um, Twitter or um, YouTube. Give me a positive review if you can. It would be help me a lot. And yeah, take good care and stay healthy. This, without further ado, this is my talk with Eric Kaysen. Here you go. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. Eric Kaysen, you're one of my favorite guests. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, for coming on again. So how are you doing, man? Pretty good. I mean, stuff's been, been pretty wild over the last couple months with what's going on. Uh, in all honesty, like one of the things that I find so incredible is that like this is, I don't want to say this is the moment that Bitcoin's been waiting for, but it, it, a lot of things are lining up that, you know, I've found more normies coming out of the woodwork being like, hey, tell me a bit about Bitcoin. Like why, why is it not suffering in the same way that, that other assets are? And so, uh, while there's a lot of dark spots, I do see a couple of points of light that I'm excited about. And I think one of those greatest things that are is that people are starting to really question the legitimacy of why, why are governments making these calls? Why are they making all these mistakes? Why can they just print out $6 trillion of money and give it mostly to themselves? Right. So, um, Okay, let's let's brainstorm just for a couple of minutes here. What's been going on uh, lately, which uh, which which leads us to our, to the core question uh, and the title of our talk is the question of um, uh, as you, as you also uh, you know elaborated in your beautiful article, uh, in your latest article on what's your website again? Uh, it's cryptosovereignty.org. Exactly, cryptosovereignty.org. Here, here you go. And the title is The Political Theology of Bitcoin. I love the last, especially the last uh, paragraphs you, uh, you elaborated on. So do you want to like, um, you know, like uh, peel off the, the essence of your article and... Um... Sure, sure. Um, so first of all, the, really what this article is, is I'm trying to take points of uh, a book that was wrote in 1922 called Political Theology. And it was actually by a German scholar named Carl Schmitt, who later actually became kind of the uh, preeminent scholar for the Nazi regime. And just to be very clear, like I'm not defending Nazism or Schmitt. I think Schmitt should have been hung at Nuremberg. I think he was just crafty enough to sneak mm. his way out of it. With that being said, uh, a lot of his political writings were then reformed by Giorgio Ambigen, who's a very famous critical theorist of sovereignty from Italy. Uh, and he has a, an ongoing dialogue both with the works of Walter Benjamin and with Michel Foucault. And essentially what I took from these things are that uh, the question of legitimacy is one of sovereignty. And in terms of the extreme emergency, uh, there's always something called a sovereign exception, essentially where there's one individual, whether it be the president, the prime minister, uh, or a series of, of various kind of power 
powerful political people who get to make the final decision. And one of the most important things is, is that that's something that the law fundamentally cannot answer, is that in cases of extreme peril where the republic is actually at stake, there must be somebody to make the sovereign decision to do things. And so what we're seeing in this latest emergency is, is most central banks that have been anointed in power uh, by various state entities, whether it's a, a Congress or a parliament, uh, they've just decided to start printing money. And they've also mm -hmm. decided to give themselves most of that money. And they've also decided that most of their citizens shouldn't get that money if, you know, in America, we're going to get a pittance of, of what the package was while, you know, banks don't have any reserve requirements anymore. They're going to get bailed out. Failing institutions like Boeing get bailed out. I mean, or, even me, private, or even private, or even private, I was just, just read uh, recently, even private uh, jet uh, companies are going to get bailed out too. Yeah, and, and to me, Marshall. like, the, the, this is a this is a clear abuse of power, but it's still happening and, and it still gets done. And the real question is, is why? Mm -hmm. Why do they get to make that decision? And so in this article, the, the political theology of Bitcoin, I kind of go through about why is it that Bitcoin doesn't seem to have this kind of emergency decree where somebody can just start printing out coins unilaterally. And essentially, through kind of working through political theology, a, a lot of what I've just Covered is that that essentially because cryptography kind of protects the core the core of Bitcoin and the way that Satoshi was able to set the supply from the very beginning and make it a continual agreement uh, that there there is no emergency decree there and there's no leader uh, it's simply a protocol that functions and moves forward with each block and what it really creates is this sort of revolutionary truth where there's no way to modify the system because there's some extreme emergency or any other means to try to create more coins for some core group of people, which I think in pretty much every single crypto that we've seen outside of Bitcoin, uh, people have made the decision either to, to, to create, uh, I forget what they called the Ethereum DAO hack, kind of reversing everything with that. They called it, uh, uh, I forget what sort of transaction they call it, but, but to me, like that was a clear move that they decided that uh, this was too, too risky for them and they would change the protocol. You know, and we sort of see that throughout crypto every time. We saw MakerDAO recently have some problems with their CPI or uh, I forgot what was going on with that. But what I see continually is that when we get to these places of crises, people decide to, to change protocols for their own benefit. And, and for me, that fundamentally breaks down a lot of how it works. So if we look at Bitcoin and what makes it so powerful, it's not even necessarily the fixed supply. But I would say that it's the actual oath and promise that Satoshi created from the very beginning that he continues to maintain to this day by the fact that we can't modify that supply. And I think it's very important. Um, and in this very beginning part, Bitcoin is subjectivity. I think it's really important that a lot of people ask this question about, you know, what is money exactly? And it, it is a social concept. And I would actually say Bitcoin is actually a form of art because of the way that we can choose subjectively to look at it, the way it's built, uh, the promises it kind of creates. And because of the way that it expresses itself artistically, particularly in uh, you know, the, the dog-eat-dog -dog world of economics, it ends up becoming the most valuable and the most precious object that there is. Exactly. Eric, you know, uh, one of the really um, best sentences or paragraphs you, you wrote in that article is which which again leads us to to the, the core uh, topic core question of uh, you know legitimacy of central banks and governments nation states and every the whole apparatus around it and within it. Uh, if I may read that loud, in a world where governments across global have promised to create infinite monetary units, swore everlasting loyalty to corporations and melomaniacs before their own citizens. The only thing left to do is refuse the broken social contract they call law and create new ones better and more fitting for our times. Through the power, glory, and grace that is Bitcoin and for the magnanimous promise that Satoshi Nakamoto has delivered to us, Bitcoin is the theological answer to the crisis of our time. Its heliotropism directs us toward a world where we use cryptographic systems to verify the truth of all things and utilize such a power to renew and recreate our systems of liberty and justice for all. <laughs> awesome. So do you want to expand on that? That because the thing is, 
Exactly. I think people are uh, hopefully finally waking up to the reality that we that we are right now in which I think people could have never ever fathomed. Like if you told them like years or you know ago that we're going to be in this kind of situation uh, with lockdown, you know, with the with the threat of abolishing cash, which is by the way now you know they're doing it in much more you know sinister way. First of all, it's about you know uh, in the name of public health. Now I can't even pay with, or at least they're at, at, they're admonishing their their customers. You know, if you can, please do not pay with cash. So so I see this progression fast and faster, um, where cash is eventually going to be abolished. I mean, where where do you see this going with everything? You know, now central the Federal Reserve now bailing out even central banks and everything is going on right now. Uh, globally with the lying through the teeth, whether it be WHO or the CCP, the Chinese government, where do you see this going? I mean, do we have time to, you know, opt out and, or is it going to be like, you know, uh, is, is seriously a, a total surveillance social credit system going to come? Uh, I do think a total surveillance and total credit system is going to come. Uh, I think fundamentally because of what the internet is and the way that cryptography functions, there's always the option and choice to opt out. Um, but it's going to become a pretty wild cat and mouse game. And I think one of the most important things is, is uh, and even I was surprised by this, uh, in America we, we have a long tradition of really believing in our public institutions and, and the way that, uh, while we think there's lots of politically, we don't, we wouldn't think that we would get direct lies that would compromise the lives of people, but that's pretty much exclusively been what this crisis has been from the forefront, is that it's been a deeply politicized process where it's clear that the political class doesn't care about the populace at all and is outright lying to us. And I think kind of the zenith of that was the CDC telling us and continues to tell us that masks don't protect us. And that, that's just a plain lie. You know, we saw during the Spanish pandemic that like during the Spanish flu pandemic, that that was one of the ways that we addressed it more than a hundred years ago. And today the, the fact that we're lying about that and people eat that is a symptom of a much larger system in the same way that they say, oh, here's this bailout that's going to help the people. Well, in that bailout, most people are going to get $1,200, not everybody, uh, but the cost to each citizen is more than $18,000. It's, it's completely absurd. When we have, we're going to see 30% unemployment in this country. Yeah, bigger, than, yeah, bigger numbers directly, than in during the, during the Great Depression, right? I mean, these would be numbers yeah. that... And, and most people can't connect that at all right now. Mm -hmm. that pretty much everyone who I've talked to, the, they seem to think that like this is going to fix itself in two or three months. And when I try to present to them, no, like we're, we're, we're at a place where normal doesn't return for a very long time, for several years, if it ever does. And uh, it's deeply alarming because part of this entire process of the government saying, no, we have it under control, we'll help you. But it's very clear they're lying to us every step of the way. And, and I think, frankly, it's, it's going to take this sort of a punishment towards people and seeing that uh, corporations are going to get bailouts and cash handouts while going to have people get kids in their homes and people really going hungry. And I think it's pretty scary because our, our political consciousness in this country is so underdeveloped. But like we're not even having conversations yet about trying to elect alternative political parties, nonetheless, even start working towards revolutionary means. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that like I'm, I'm such a strong crypto anarchist is that like I don't believe any of this can be done inside of the system. Like I essentially think people need to go underground, acquire Bitcoin for themselves, utilize cryptography to organize themselves. Uh, and one of the other frank truths is in the United States, we have the right and privilege to own guns. And as scary as it is, uh, I think it's going to go in a violent direction where yeah. people need to their self-sovereignty to try to protect yeah. themselves. Yeah, there's no other way around it. I don't see, to be honest with you, I don't see really a peaceful, super harmonious transition. Um, I think we are in the precipice. I think uh, Marty Ben just uh, uh, published also an article. He talked about like, we are on the precipice. So this is going to be like, uh, you know, which direction, you know, is, are you individual? You know, like sovereignty, liberty seeking individual, which way do you want it? Like, do you understand the situation you are in? I think the core question hasn't been really understood by most people. Do you see that same way? I mean, yeah, there's they, um, particularly where I live, you know, like I, I live in a place in Northern California that has pretty, pretty liberal blue state ideals. And there's a, a real head in the sand kind of thing of like, oh, like we'll, we'll work this out. It'll be contentious. <laughs> like, 
uh, I see these people being confronted by the fascists and the socialists within the year of being like, choose a side because this isn't, we're going to fight and we're going to try to figure it out. And the truth is it's real scary because we don't have the political consciousness uh, for libertarian socialism in this country. And we seem to be leaning towards uh, having a real appeal towards fascism. And people like to call Trump a fascist, but he's not nearly principled enough to be a fascist. You know, like I, I think he's just a corporate oligarch that, that you know, he's clearly mm -hmm. bailing out all of his cronies and friends. But I, I think he's paving the way for us to get um, a Mussolini kind of character to come in because in, in a, there, there's a very deep appeal and satisfaction that people want a strong leader who will go ahead and give them justice, you know? And uh, frankly, if I saw somebody gunning for the politicians and taking their heads, I, 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 I wouldn't know how I would react to that because as scary as it was, I would at least feel an appeal that somebody was trying to do something. And it's very scary because I would love if this fantastical idea of democracy and republicanism to work out, but it's clear that that's totally failed. And I think uh, we can't quite yet see the new systems because I think the new systems are going to be these libertarian, cryptographically propelled systems similar to Bitcoin. And I feel like if we can use Bitcoin as kind of the, uh, the general shilling point for all of us to meet up at, that we'll start creating the new systems that can be the answer to it. But I still think that that is years away and that there is going to be very, very strong conflict in the interim. Mm -hmm. Do you see, um, you see, we, we talked, um, we talked a couple of times, you know, about, uh, what, what do people need? Like, you know, the pain, the suffering, the, the necessity, uh, which then arises out of that, you know, the human action, like, do you see like, um, let's say, you know, the purchasing power, the decline of purchasing power, like felt by people sooner than expected. Like once, once they go into UBI and, you know, helicopter money, do, do you think like the hyperinflationary tendencies or hyperinflation itself could, 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 you know, rush people into uh, converge, you know, people into, uh, to, to Bitcoin? Uh, to be honest, like I, I think it's always going to be a fight of an intolerant minority against a, you know, frankly, a, an ignorant majority. And I'm, I'm not con concerned about uh, getting everybody on the Bitcoin train at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm concerned with converting people that are interested in protecting, taking the steps to, to do that. You know, like I, I've always taken the stance uh, of the idea of trying to get everybody on board is pretty much impossible because, I mean, Look at this crisis. Like most people have failed miserably at understanding what exponential growth means, and they haven't been able to put those two together even at this point in time. Um, so I, I do think seeing the very severe and punishing affects is going to get uh, like a, a good number of people on board. But I, I think most people will still shove their head in the sand and, and be like, "We just need more UBI. We just need to print out more money." Um, and I and I honestly think that. Uh, What's probably going to happen is, is the Chinese are going to create their own new IMF kind of system, their own new Brenton Woods agreement, where essentially they're, they're probably going to hijack blockchain technology and, and make uh, some shitty digital panopticon R&D mm -hmm. currency that, that they'll, they'll just give to all sorts of various governments to help sponsor them out of this. Uh, and it's extremely dangerous. And I think it's amazing, uh, you know, like the money printer go burr meme, I think is fantastic because it captures how ludicrously stupid this all is. Like people literally think you can just print out money infinitely and that it won't lose value. And I think in America, because we've never suffered an inflationary crisis, uh, at least not in several generations, that most people sincerely can't believe that the purchasing power of the dollar would start collapsing. And while we are seeing uh, other countries dollarize and those countries' currencies collapsing compared to the U.S. dollar, you know, like the, uh, the Austrian dollar or the Australian dollar lost a huge amount of value recently against the dollar. I think that's a very temporary thing until we start to see the cancel on effect take, take place, helicopter money actually being dropped. And then I think we're going to start seeing switches to who knows? You know, it's, it becomes a real open playing field. I'm, I'm intrigued with how the Russians are going to respond because they've been stocking up on gold in the recent past. And so maybe we'll go back to a gold-based system. Maybe Bitcoin will have something to do with it. But I sincerely can't imagine a future where governments acknowledge that Bitcoin is the best and hardest 
there is. And I think that that's just going to be something that has to be forced onto them from, from without through, you know, uh, anarchist movements and, and the, the, the crypto anarchy movement of what Bitcoin is and having more and more people make the choice for themselves. You know, I guess, I guess in my ideal world, let's say five years after all this happens, there's been severe collapse where maybe the depression caused by all of this, that there will be a huge network of, of local providers who, who essentially, you know, and, and uh, like I have a, a pretty large garden and I, I sell food at, at farmer's markets every once in a while. Um, you know, I'm like, I'll, I'll just accept exclusively Bitcoin. If people want to pay them with cash, they're going to pay, you know, 20 or 30 percent more. And I think there's going to be a huge network of people that will have similar beliefs and that will start naturally creating itself. Let's talk about gold, uh, Eric. Now, uh, as you uh, might have heard, you know, that there's this gap uh, between physical and, and paper gold. And uh, because of the whatever this whole pandemic, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it, refineries, like the largest ones, would it be in Switzerland, uh, South Africa, yeah, like Can the, the Canada, person. yeah, they've just closed down, right? So, is that the reason for the for the for the problems with you know for the delivery problems, or do they really have the rehypothecated? I mean, you know, I mean, what could be the reasons for? Uh, I think that there's a long-standing issue. We've always seen that paper gold has far outstripped the supply of real physical gold. Mm -hmm. You know, and like uh, I, I had a friend ask me about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, oh, like, really? Like, the banks were lying to us about being able to actually deliver on that physical gold? No way. Oh, who would have thought the banks would lie to us? Uh, and so I think, like, essentially, like, this is the emperor wears no clothes sort of situation coming up. It turns out that they're liars. It turns out that they can't deliver any of the physical gold. We'll see the difference between paper gold and physical gold continue to get larger and larger until at some point I actually just expect that that paper gold will collapse in its entirety because it'll turn out there's nothing behind it in the exact same way that we've historically seen banks collapse when people go to redeem their dollars for gold, you know, before the, mm -hmm. the turn of the 20th century, turns out they just don't have any. And my, my hope is, is that uh, after, you know, maybe a year or two of this of, of lie after lie after lie after lie after lie, uh, that that people develop such a, a putrid bile in their own mouth that they just they won't buy or accept anything that that these trash mongers try to give to us, you know. Because my greatest truth at the end of the day is like th these people are snakes and criminals. Like all that they do is, is perpetuate all these stupid models that they probably don't even understand and try to use to convince other people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was talking to my father recently about before this whole crisis started, he had a financial advisor that. He had worked with for a couple of years, but but as this crisis was coming, he really started to come to the realization of that, like this guy, this guy doesn't give a shit about me at all. He just cares about getting some fucking trade on the book so that he can go tell his boss about that, mm -hmm. you know. And and it's fortunate enough that like he took some of my advice and went to cash before the market crashed. But you know, I, I told him he should have moved more of it and put some in Bitcoin. But he's still struggling with kind of understanding Bitcoin on a whole, which is fair. I'm like, I don't, I don't expect. Yeah. I don't expect for a lot of the older generation to, to get Bitcoin. I simply expect for them to pretty much lose all of their money and for the new class of, of true capitalists, you know, not, not statists who want to get some benefit from the state, but m free market entrepreneurs to take up, to step up and take the place of essentially taking on the banking establishment by saying, look, we can, we can be our own bank. We can secure our own money and fortunes, you know? And like the, the big problem I always saw with gold was like, I think it's a pretty great money overall, but when the government shows up the pistol with me, like they're, what am I going to do? Please don't, you know, and, and, in you know, in the United States, I'm, I'm always amazed that people don't know about executive order 6102 where mm. FDR said, Hey, federal officials go into the bank, steal everybody's gold, and then we'll give them this shitty cash in exchange. And people really don't think that that'll happen here. And in all honesty, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Coinbase got nationalized. Brian Brooks went over to, to uh, recently be the director of the Comptroller of Currency. And yeah, it's unbelievable. I wouldn't be surprised if that yeah. idea has been floated. Yeah, I actually, I remember when I was at Coinbase, I, like, did the introductory conversation with him right before I had left, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just pretty funny that, like, now he's directing the banking system. So, I mean, they... they they know what blockchain technology is. And I think like they're, they're still in this blockchain, not Bitcoin phase. 
And it's hilarious because, like, it's a Trojan horse. Like, people don't realize, like, you make your shitty blockchain system. And while it works, people go, oh, hey, you can still criminalize us and trace our transactions. But if we use Bitcoin, there's at least a stand chance to stand up against that. And I think by the time they deploy all these blockchain systems, there's going to be a moment of, oh, shit, Bitcoin still works and we can't stop it. And mm -hmm. that'll be pretty fun. I think there's, a, there's always, of course, you know, uh, a, a lag in the technological development. So once the demand uh, out of necessity, again, you know, comes to demand, uh, and then liquidity rises exponentially and the volume rises and, and, and there's a need, you know, so I, uh, eventually all these, um, uh, uh, hopefully, you know, user-friendly technology is going to come out uh, uh, and, and, and really start serving you know, people, uh, would it be, uh, you know, buying, storing, mixing, coin joining, uh, uh, enhancing your privacy. So all these things, um, will come eventually. Um, so to tie this in again with, uh, the question of the legitimacy of governments and central banks, you know, I remember when I studied law, there was, uh, there was this, um, there was, um, one subject we had, it's, you know, it was called uh, philosophy of law. And there was a philosopher, I think it was, his name was Walzer, I'm not sure, but it was in the context you know, of Nazi regime and, and national socialism, you know, and he said, when, 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 when a law or when, when something, you know, when, when, when uh, the, uh, a legal entity sort of, uh, or, or a law or something that you have to follow, is become so suppressed, so oppressive, so unjust, then you have, it's actually your moral obligation, your ethical obligation, uh, your very right to disobey that law. Can you extrapolate that <laughs> to the situation yeah. we're in right now? Uh, I mean, it's very clear, like we're, we're well beyond that point, but I think people have lived in fear and terror for so long that they, they've completely relegated that out of their mind. And uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Hannah Arendt, uh, she's well known for writing Eichmann in Jerusalem and having the phrase, the banality of evil. Uh, and, and what I think is so important about that phrase is uh, people, like the people in the central banks, the director of the Fed, like the, these people... I sincerely believe are evil, not because they're out there wanting to do malicious things, but they actually can't even fundamentally connect that what they're doing is harmful and hurtful to people. Mm -hmm. And so the, I don't think the onerous is on them to, to understand that. The onerous is on us to reject it and to hold them responsible and accountable. Because keep in mind, through, through the entire trial of Eichmann, he defended himself and, and really maintained that he thought he was doing the right thing. And that was the thing that, that Arendt pointed out. She was like, look, this is, a, this is a stupid man. He always appealed to authority. He was always chasing after trying to be in the inn and get approval. And so like, he simply never had the willpower to go, oh, maybe shipping a bunch of Jews off to death camps isn't the right thing. So in the same way that like, I don't expect for police officers to take off their badge and be like, whoa, I've, I've betrayed the constitution. I'm, I'm hurting people. No, I... I expect for them to join up in the ranks and, and start shooting people. And so I think it's really important that at some point in time, we really start, instead of thinking about things in legal context, we think about them in ethical and moral context. Right. I remember one time I was talking with a DA uh, and I was pretty much scolding her. And I was like, you're like, what you do is fundamentally criminal. Like you, you, and, and I was like, and I want to be really clear. You're not doing criminal things in a legal context. You're doing them in an ethical and a moral context. And I think one of the things that's really important is that as a people that have completely lost any idea of spirituality, like we're all going to fucking die. And at the end, we have to deal with what the consequences of that means, not necessarily right. what comes afterwards, but sitting on our deathbed thinking about, wow, when I did that thing, was that okay? How will my children look at me? How will my children's children look at me? You know, and I, I think there is still a great reckoning to get there. But the truth is the onerous is on us, you know, because the, we've lived in such a deep authoritarian world for so long. I've found that most people have just completely disposed of critical thinking, you know, and I've found that repeatedly in this crisis of where I go, look at the numbers, look at the charts, look at the projections, look at what's being said. Where do you think this ends? And most of them are like, uh, in, in two, two months when the curve is flattened, go, oh, really? So we can go to 30% unemployment and we get back to three in two months, it, you know, and it, it sincerely, they can't go, oh, shit. 
And I think part of it is, is because there's a real struggle to, to critically think because it's been excused for so long. But there's also been this very interesting, um, people have really confused legal predications for, for, for ethical and, and moral considerations. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that as people find they're abandoned again and again by these institutions that were supposed to protect them. Right. Um, do you think people are ready for taking self responsibility, you know, in order to, to go into that path to, you know, self sovereignty and liberty? I mean, I know you touched already on, upon that, but do you think people are ready are mature enough to, to take self responsibility for their own, you know, actions um, and, and processes and, and decisions and, and lives? Is, is that, I mean, or have they just, uh, people have just, um, forgotten even what freedom is. And that's, that's, I think, my main concern is that people don't even, can't even imagine what it would be like to live in a, not in a state, nation state, governmental entity, but in a, uh, let's just call it, you know, privately organized, private law, if you want, you know, uh, you know, we're going, if you want to talk about private properties and why not a private society, like clusters of private societies? I mean, people, I think, need to, uh, uh, and now we have the technologies, we have the infrastructure, we have, we, I think we have the, the, this evolution of maturity already. You know, if we talked about this like hundred years ago, okay, you know, there was uh, just a lot of obstacles still, but do you think now is the time? Now is the time or do you think this is like a maturity process? So, you know, gradual uh, and subtly. I, I think it's going to be gradual and subtle for, the explicit reason of that, uh, like it's just too jarring for most people. Most people haven't made hard decisions in their life. Most people haven't had to save for a crisis like these. Um, but I actually, I, I feel strongly that essentially, uh, you know, children that are between the ages of five and 10, I think going through this crisis and watching what happens to their parents, uh, I think that within five to 10 years, uh, they will create the new base for this kind of a society. Mm -hmm in conjunction with like, I don't, I don't want to throw everybody away. Like I, I do believe there's a very strong and intolerant minority, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which a lot of Bitcoiners are, um, you know, and even here in the United States, like uh, while we have right wing libertarians that, that are like pretty crazy and conspiracy theorists, like I, I really love the idea that they're, they're attached to, to gun ownership and armor armament because the, the main idea is that, uh, you know, like I do expect for this all to go in a pretty crazy direction. And I really think that, uh, individual gun ownership is, is going to be a point that's really going to allow for people to protect themselves both from governments and from the kind of the chaos that's going to come, come about from this. And uh, furthermore, that like I, I really think a, a free society needs that. And I've found it very irritating at how, how much liberals in the United States have wanted to create taking guns away from private citizens like a key point of reduction in violence. And I always tell them, look, like, I'm absolutely with you on disarmament, but go, get the guns out of goddamn police hands first, and then you can take my gun away. You know, um, I don't ever fee see that happening in this country, but you know, it, it, it's a hope. And so I think as we watch all of this chaos go down, uh, I think essentially we're going to get communal networks that'll start popping up. More and more people will start using Bitcoin, and and I think like where we'll actually see the spark ignite things is. I would love to see an anarcho syndicalist union that is essentially committed around politicizing Bitcoin and creating a new sort of political system. You know, I've, I've thought about trying to create a political party here in the United States that's explicitly about utilizing crypto syndicalism to create localized networks of people using cryptography, mm -hmm. uh, of people, of networks of people with 3D printed guns that they can work with each other and establish, but also just general community networks, you know, like, uh, I think growing a garden right now is probably one of the most important things to do because particularly in this country, people, people fundamentally believe that food insecurity and that hunger can't come here. But if you look at right now, like, uh, have you seen in Africa, how there, there's a locust swarm that's pretty much destroying crops mm -hmm. all across West Africa, you know, and like people really struggle to understand that that weighs on a global system and that the direction that we're going, uh, like I can totally see most countries restricting imports to the United States. And then also in the United States, the average age of a farmer here is like 59, you know, and they tend to be conservative, but pretty much everything points towards like, this is the people that coronavirus is going to take out. 
And so, you know, I very much see transportation systems collapsing in a way that, that local food networks are going to be essential to feeding people, you know, and like, uh, I've had great and brilliant friends, you know, that I've known through the crypto community come over who, you know, like they, they can build an entire cryptographic system from scratch, but they, they see a raspberry plant, they go, whoa, raspberries grow on canes? I'm like, holy shit, dude, like you're brilliant, but like you should learn a thing or two about how stuff grows. Um, you know, and so like, I think kind of all of these things comorborating between each other is going to force people to start taking more responsibility, which is going to start to create kind of the, the dyads that will create these new networks. Uh, and I sincerely hope at some point in time, we'll get uh, some phenomenal organizers to start creating a political, I guess, crypto syndicalist union at some point. You know, um, if we go back to uh, Darwin, I think Darwin, I think when he died, he admitted sort of uh, half-heartedly his own mistakes in his fallacies of thinking, I think. But anyway, it's it's it was more about like competition. Do you think like we're going now from a from one paradigm to another, like from uh, competition to cooperation? And because of the pressure, because of the pain, the suffering, structures breaking down, businesses now going you know bankrupt, insolvent, uh, with all you know with everything that's going on, you know, unemployment like exponentially rising, people are going to feel this. So, do you think we're going to have like uh, you know, um, like little clusters of cooperatives everywhere? Uh, I, I think it's going to start naturally developing that way just because of a pure need. And, you know, like a, something, a conversation that's been coming up more and more uh, locally in the United States is rent strikes. You know, and also I think uh, just yesterday, both Amazon and Instacart had strikes going on. And I think it kind of leads with this, this socialist idea and I think it'll kind of fall apart under its own weight here in the United States. But I think it'll actually really show to people, uh, you do have direct political power. There are abilities to, to create cooperation. And uh, like, I'm a huge fan of Peter Copton and, and his book, the, the Conquest of Bread. You know, and I, I think, uh, you know, Darwin's ideas of competition, as you said, you know, he admitted that that cooperation is this big thing. And that's part of what, what Peter Copton wrote in the Conquest of Bread was like, look, there there are all of these relationships in nature where animals work together as opposed to opposed to each other. And naturally that's one of the great ways that, that humanity can work together is through these cooperative actions, which frankly, like that's actually what the social contract is, you know? And uh, from my work with Schmidt, I also go all the way back to the original theorist of the state, uh, Thomas Hobbes. And one of the points I'm, I'm very, very pedantic about is he, he points out that, the fundamental agreement between the subject and the sovereign is that of protection and safety. Mm -hmm. The moment that the sovereign can no longer offer you protection or safety, like that contract is null and void. Exactly. And I think people are starting to register that that contract is null and void. And so now we're actually getting to this place where we realize we have to provide that for ourselves. And as we create the networks and the abilities to start providing this for ourselves and the ability for us to start acting more cooperatively, I think naturally we're going to start seeing the, the, the nascent pieces of uh, essentially like localized capitalism starting to pop up. And I think it's really exciting because uh, local governments, while they have a lot of their own problems, I think there's a huge potential for people to, to radicalize and change them in very powerful ways. And I think that that's essentially what's going to happen as people realize the federal government's abandoned them, uh, you know, state governments in a lot of places have abandoned them. And I think they'll find at the, the community level and at the local level that stuff will start to create itself naturally just because it has to, you know. And frankly, the places that don't create those networks, I expect for them to experience, frankly, like low-level civil war kind of stuff. People doing home invasion and shooting each other to try to get food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sadly, yeah. Um, you see, the thing is, um, now talk about nation-state governments, central banks, it's, I think, it's all about education, of course. It all starts with children, I think. It, it, that's why you know, I'm a total advocate. I, I don't have myself children, but if I had children, I wouldn't, I wouldn't send them to school just for the social contract, just for you know, uh, socializing. That's the only reason uh, schools might be good. But otherwise, uh, in terms of you know, gaining knowledge, understanding, comprehension, you know, being creative and, and inspiring these children um, and really telling them the truth, <laughs> like, what, what kind of structures like we have 
entities like the central banks who are again you know politically untouchable legally unaccountable and criminally immune and systematically stealing <laughs> privately owned and controlled so what kind of structure is that i mean that we have to adhere to that we have to adhere to the to the laws and 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 and, uh, and the orders i mean it's 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 mind boggling we should think about it yeah i mean like i i I've, I've i don't so so i actually have a, a background in education I, I was actually trying to be a, a school counselor back around 2010 um and and my year long foray into that i quickly realized that uh it's deeply politicized and a lot of people there, you know, they sincerely have good intentions, but they're authoritarians through and through, you know, and when I, I tried to protect kids from getting kicked out of school because, you know, uh, essentially like they, they were homeless and had lots of personal problems, uh, administrators were like, look, like this isn't our problem to deal with, like kick them out to, to go to some other school, like they're, they're the bad kids and, and we can't really help them. And kind of as I started to unravel that whole process, I really realized that like, this is a deeply authoritarian system that that is pedantically about making sure people obey, 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 obey. Um, and, and it was really troubling and disturbing. And that's eventually why I moved away from it. And, uh, you know, like people forget that like, oh, like was everybody just, just dumb and stupid 200 years ago? Absolutely not. Like there was all kinds of alternative education systems. And particularly when I think people start to organize privately and decide for themselves, hey, like how do we want people to learn? What kind of education do we want? Um, I think really powerful things can happen. And I think with what we're seeing with the suspension of schools and people moving online, uh, that there, there's great new opportunities. And I think one of the most powerful lessons coming out from this whole thing is that uh, like the social contract we've been sold is bullshit. The fact that uh, people have to go to school, that, that we have to go to work, that, that we have to pay rent, like all of these things turn out that they're not actually essential to society or life. Um, and like one of the things I find the most intriguing is that like, all right, if we do this UBI thing, if it goes on till June, do you really think when it's all said and done, people are like, okay, like it's all over. Like, let's, let's everybody like go back to this shitty job that you hate and work for $12. Like, are you insane? Like, no way. Like you broke the social contract under this predication that we don't need to do it anymore. So why should people continue? And I think a large part of that process is going to be the education. And, and as people start to learn these fundamental facts, uh, I think it's going to take a while for them to accept it because it's so horrifying. But I think once they start to see, oh, the banks aren't criminally liable. Oh, you know, uh, BIS is the result of a fucking Nazi bank being turned into to the largest global provider of liquidity in the world. Like, these are things that are like so insane and far-fetched that like people don't want to believe it at all. Mm -hmm. I remember I was talking to a good friend of mine about, uh, you know, how IBM helped with the catalog cataloging of people for Nazi Germany, like eventually for the Holocaust. And she like, she couldn't even believe that she totally rejected. She was like, you, you need to check your facts. <laughs> and I was like, no, you, you need to check yours. Like this is part of the reality that we live in, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, when I tell people the fact that the American government explicitly worked with, with Nazi and SS soldiers and, and extracted them for our own purposes, that like they can't even believe that. Now, they like, can't who believe the fuck that, no. do you think hunted down Che Guevara in Bolivia? You know, exactly. like we we didn't know how to do that. We we got former Nazis to go do that stuff right. for us. Or just take Operation you know, Paperclip. And, I mean, there were like how many thousands, 50,000 uh, uh, former uh, Nazi scientists? So. You know, and, and that's one of the reasons that uh, my philosophy is so deeply embedded with Giorgio Ambigen, because like, he, he makes this argument that, like, what happened in World War II was so horrible that it fundamentally broke the law, and there was no way to ever recover that, and we didn't know how, you know? And, like, uh, one of the most amazing things to me that came out of Nuremberg was uh, when Goring was talking, he was like, look, he's like, we, we're not doing anything unique. Like, this is the formula that all states use. And I thought it was pretty interesting because at that point they approached like fucking kill him already. Jesus, like he's, he's making us look bad. Um, and I think it's really interesting because to me, like one thing I always try to emphasize to people is how many genocides were illegal? Right. How many times did we see that stuff? You know, right. and uh, it's really alarming because people, people like have this idea that like the, the Nazi regime was like this horrible, evil thing that rose up to, 
to kill and destroy people and everybody who participated in it was evil. But no, it actually turns out that like Germans tend to be extremely law abiding people and that when you put them in a position where the law acts, asks them to do these terrible ethical crimes, a lot of them don't know how to deal with that conflict. And I see, very much see the same thing here in the United States with the way that people uh, want to celebrate law enforcement irregardless of the kind of crimes that they perpetrate. You know, I was just reading this morning that uh, I, I forget where it was. It was somewhere on the East Coast that, that you know, there was a home invasion where, where an EMT was shot behind. And it turns out she was innocent and there was no reason for them to be there. But I find it deeply alarming in the way that when this stuff comes up, people want to defend law enforcement and say, well, their job's hard and, you know, mistakes are made and this, that and the other. And I think I'm really hoping the truth is, is as these systems break down, like one thing that we've already seen is places like Philadelphia, they're like, hey, we're not going to enforce all of these low level crimes. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. And eventually people are going to be like, oh, like self-protection is like our own job. And instead of like hiring these individuals who go and hide behind a blue wall and have their entire livelihood staked upon the idea of being police, maybe it needs to be a community fair. Maybe it needs to be a voluntary basis where we all take turns doing, it. you know, like I, I'm not really sure, but something I've always maintained that people are really scared of is like, I'm super interested in destroying these systems. And most people are like, but what comes after it? Like, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I think it's better than what we have. And I, and I don't disagree that it's super scary, the idea of going into that. But I think what's more scary is giving these people that power uh, of surrendering our rights to say, hey, you can spy on me. You can track where I'm going. You can, you can make unilateral decisions for what's right and what's wrong. And I think the idiocy of, uh, you know, here in California, we've closed all the state parks. We've, we've really tried to lock people into their homes, which, you know, I think makes the, this disease spread a bit easier being indoors all the time. But in conjunction with the fact of that, like, why was it that we were able to go through the Spanish flu 100 years ago? Oh, yeah, we were militant about people wearing masks and we didn't destroy the economy or shut it down. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. and, and like the thing that I find the scariest about this whole crisis is, is the extreme mismanagement from top to bottom of literally at every place that decisions can be made. They pretty much make the worst decisions they can. And I think that this extraordinary incompetency has been so damning and damaging that, that I'm, I'm personally outraged. And I can't even believe when I hear from people citing the CDC or the WHO that I'm like, why would you believe these people after the lies that they've perpetrated over and over to us? Like, did they, did they suddenly have some moral conflict inside of themselves where they had to start telling the truth? No, you're just not looking at the whole picture. Right. But a lot of people don't want to hear that and they'd rather shove their head in the sand, which they have every right to do that. And, and you know, I, I think it's sad because we're going to see a lot of people get hurt because they can't use their own critical thinking to try to engage in stuff. I'm intrigued that the Chinese people have still not, you know, risen up and, and, and revolt. I think there are, you know, here and there small revolts and, and protests, but, but not really something substantial of nature. So this makes me... Um, yeah, it makes me makes me really sad because it's it it shows us you know how how fearful how how dumbed down and numbed down and and indoctrinated brainwashed people are or, or or I don't know are just crying out for please more state more government more more you know controllers put us under lockdown you know um, even you know here over here in so called Western European civilized societies people are you know crying out for more state intervention it seems yeah i remember there's a great quote from emma goldman about how how people cry out for the whips and the chains of of, of their masters and how people want to be dominated and that the the first people to cry out crucify are the masses you know and um specifically here in america like we we've had this long campaign of brainwashing about like freedom is just americanism Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's a very strange idea because, uh, like I think freedom's, uh, it's a very scary idea. And, uh, you know, Eric Fromm wrote, wrote a book back in the forties called the fear of freedom. And, and I think that it's a very deep psychological affect, you know, and, uh, I don't blame the, the Chinese people, you know, like they've, I think after the horrors of what Mao did in the cultural revolution mm -hmm. and, and those sort of things, uh, I, I think there was a fundamental, um, 
kind of breaking of where this, that society has existed so long without being able to question in any way that the, that like when that comes up, it's so scary that people really shove it away pretty quickly. You know, and I, I, I don't have a strong expectation for those people to be able to, to rise up and throw off the yoke of the Communist Party. Um, it's possible it could happen, but I, I don't have a strong faith in it. You know, like I, I think at best uh, through their own internal conflicts that perhaps things will rise up, but, but I don't have strong faith in it, you know, in, mm -hmm. in addition to in the same way here in America, people ha have been deeply, deeply propagandized and, and told all sorts of lies so that, you know, we believe that our cage is a comfortable home. You know, we, we think that the police are, are giving us safety and security as opposed to endangering us. You know, like mm -hmm. we, we think that this two party system is the only fundamental answer to democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so funny the way that we have taken a two party totalitarian state and tried to make that into the democratic principle is, is so absurdist to me. And I try to debate with people about this, about, okay, like if, if we're really a democracy, why is it that only two parties are ever possible for, for seizing the, the opportunity or election? And I always get some bullshit answer about third parties, but it, you know, it never works out. Oh, we have a multi-party so, here. You know, do you think it's the same shit? It's just, you know, more colors, more, 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 you know, fragmentation sort of, you know, but it's at the end of the day, it's the structure. It's the, the whole unethical, you know, foundation that it's working on. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether it's a conservative or green party or social Democrats or, or, you know, <laughs> well, I'm like, you know, I, I want to be clear, like, I think the invention of the democratic process was pretty great. And that like parliaments and, and congresses have worked pretty well for 200 years. I think yeah. over the last 100 years, but you know, the 200 years since their invention, and then over the last 100 years, I think they've broken down pretty significantly. But at what point do we say is enough is enough? Like, at what point do we say it's time to create a new political system that's much more fitting for our time? Because, like, I don't think at any point in time, uh, the founding fathers or, or any other sort of governments that got created, people were like, hey, maybe one day we'll have these magical boxes where, you know, we can talk with each other over literally halfway around the world from one another. And I, I, I would really love to see the formation of some system that tries to use that. And, like, the, my strongest truth is, is, like, I, I don't think uh, top-down democracy as we see it works at all. But I do see these like localized syndicalist networks pushing power up from the bottom, being able to work really well, actually. Like, this is I what we urgently need, localism, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And so like, if we invert the structure, so instead of uh, the mm -hmm. federal government being the most powerful entity, if local governments are, you know, I find it really interesting that uh, like the, the original confederation agreement that the United States had was, was pretty great, but the problem was the money issue you know it was like right. there wasn't the ability for the federal government to tax and that there was different currencies for all the states and they really struggled with that well there's a new opportunity to try to do something similar to that you know and and the the negotiation i usually make with people when we debate about you know because they're always like you can't have anarchy it can't work like the bone i'll throw them is i go look like I, i'm cool with the idea of trying to dissolve the federal government at this point and pushing all power back to the states like i'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that idea most people don't buy it, but I, I very sincerely believe that if we were able to strip power out of the federal government in the United States, that we could create new systems where the states could work together pretty collaboratively. Um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is that in order to get there, we need revolutionary principles. Uh, and actually, one thing that's really exciting is in the U.S. Constitution, there's something called Article, which is actually this like backwards way that we can kind of, uh, you're familiar with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I would really love to see a, a revolutionary movement to try to pass and amend the U S constitution using article five by ramming stuff through the state level, by by using strong local politics to do that. Uh, I think we would get to the place where like the article was amended and like the Supreme court would essentially suspend it. And we would use that as the signal. Like now it's time to actively agitate and, mm -hmm. you know, create revolution against it. But at this point, people are so far away from the idea of revolutionary politics um, that I don't see that happening for a couple of years. But, yeah. you know, the, the, this pretty punishing depression, I think, is going to 
really help people start entertaining a lot of new notions. Yeah. You know, um, Michael Krieger, do you know Michael Krieger? Uh, I had him also on my show. Uh, he also writes, um, what's his uh, website? Liberty blitzcreek.com i think or something like that so yeah, i think yeah, you guys could article. get well uh um uh, i'd love to have you both like on a panel to talk because uh, from principles that you're talking about like you know going back to localism and you know the power should go from local communities or even you know municipalities or something like that so so i think this is the future that we are i think we're deep deep inside our uh, striving for um so you know uh I think there is going to be chaos. There is going to be pain. It's not going to be painless, this transition. The question is, is it going to be like a short one, you know, as painless as possible? Is it going to be like a prolongated, procrastinated pain process where it's going to be, you know, different levels of chaos and panic and fear and, and uncertainty? Uh, what I was also going to ask, you know, like uh, the Atlantic Council of, you know, the NATO just the think tank of the of the of the um, NATO is the Atlantic Council, and they this they propose to uh, be, in the name of public you know uh, national security or in public health to 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 call out uh, martial law. I mean, <laughs> in in European Union. I mean, this is this is just uh, uh, unbelievable. Uh, martial yeah, law. I mean, it's it's really scary. Like. Uh... You know, and also recently with uh, the Hungarian prime minister and all those mm. emergency decrees that were passed for him, like, I, I um, as dark as stuff is here in America, like, I think stuff's darker for Europe because uh, the mismanagement of the EU, the mismanagement of the European currency, uh, the idea of martial law being deployed, you know, like, you guys were stripped of, uh, of weapons long ago. And so like the, the idea of trying to fight against those things is, is, is pretty much ludicrous. And uh, you know, like it, it's very clear that the banking elite, the political elite, uh, the wealthy have their own stake at hand and it's being handled. And I kind of think as everything burns, they're just gonna kind of let people suffer. And I, I, I'm not familiar enough with the localities or the ways that they would struggle against it. But mm -hmm. from what I see, it, it's good in conjunction with, uh, it's very clear that states have made alliances with each other to be able, you know, like I assume that the, the Austrian military isn't a terribly large contingency, but with that being said, they can send in a bunch of forces from all over to be able right. to do those sort of enforcement. Exactly. And I think uh, that that's one of the more troubling things that you guys have. Whereas at least here in the United States, we, we do have the one federal United States government. If we had martial law, it would be really interesting to see the way that those enforcements are played out and the mm -hmm. sort of loyalties that people display. Um, you know, and it, and, and it does become really interesting because maybe it plays out on a state level or maybe people do fight against the federal government directly. Like, I, I, I'm not really sure, but I do have a strong feeling that martial law will be declared in both jurisdictions. Um, and it's going to be scary because I, I think we're going to see a lot of kangaroo court kind of bullshit where, you know, you have somebody that goes out to walk their dog and they'll be thrown in jail for three years. You'll have somebody that's out trying to look for food and, you know, they'll get thrown away in some internment camp somewhere, you know. And, and here in the United States, like, I fully expect for us to spin up prisons out in the middle of the desert where we're going to send people out to starve to death because we're uninterested in having people try to break any sort of, of formal protocols that we put down no matter what they are and i think that that's going to be kind of the the apex of the authoritarian crisis is seeing that stuff happen repeatedly i think at some point uh you know like i i'm, I'm hoping somebody's just going to lose their mind and go full john brown on this thing and just start saying it's it's now or never you know mm -hmm. it what, what does marty bent say if not uh if if not me who if not now when you know, exactly. um, yes. and I think that that's a really powerful idea because this is time for for Bitcoin and crypto anarchists to stand up and say these people want to track our every movement. They want to put spy cams in our home and they want to make sure that that we do everything according to what makes them safe and secure, not makes us safe and secure. And we have the means, the technology and the ability to resist it. And now is the time. Um, 
yeah, you know, and I, I, I pray that that person pops up and presents themselves soon because, you know, I, I would be happy to, to join their powerful alliance and, and do my part. But I haven't seen anything that looks like that quite just yet. You know, the, the, the scary thing is uh, that the, these centralized structures with governments, uh, central banks, uh, what have you, are like giving it, us, giving it to humanity now in their faces. It's like, you know, it's not subtle anymore. It's not like circumventing it. It's like in your faces. It's like, this is the, you know, this is reality, you know, eat or die or something like that, you know, and this is, so I wonder, you know, how long people are going to put up with this because once they see, like, as we see now, you know, uh, all kinds of corporations, banks, and, 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 and um, you know, the elite or whatever you want to call it, um, getting bailed out while, while people are expecting, like, in the hope, like, they're going to get, like, uh, like a UBI. <laughs> like, a, um, I mean, it's ludicrous. Like, $1,200, what, what, what kind of money is that? I mean, by that time, you know, we're going to have real, real monetary debasement. So, um, People I mean, and most it. people don't understand that. That, yeah, like that's the that's the sort of chump change bribe that we're being thrown for the destruction of our monetary system in exchange for corporate socialism. And like, I, I don't think most people even understand how inflation functions or how it's going to affect them. They they sincerely think that they're going to get twelve hundred dollars and that they'll go to the store and that eggs will still be four dollars and a gallon of milk will still be you know four or five dollars and that everything will work out merrily and i really think that when they show up to spend their money you know a gallon of milk is going to be twenty dollars and a carton of eggs is going to be twenty five dollars and they're not going to understand why and i think at that point there'll be some outrage uh but in all honesty like i don't see the system changing at all until the guillotine comes out and people are like fuck it we're going to kill these people and I think one of the most destructive things that's happened in America is, is this complete idea of the unilaterally of nonviolence. And, and I want to be very clear, like, I, I, don't, I don't think violence is a solution at mm. all. But I think when it gets to a place of pushing and pushing and pushing and breaking the law, breaking the agreements, breaking the contracts and making it very clear that they're going to steal from us, that they're going to do horrible and unethical things that are going to drive all of us into poverty. Yeah. Like I, I think these people need to be held accountable, you know, and I, and I don't expect for any of these systems to hold them accountable in any tenable way. And I really think when revolutionary councils start getting together and seizing these people and making it very clear that they've perpetrated crimes against the people and that we start going into crazy revolutionary shit, I think that's when the message will actually start to get delivered. But uh, I, I, I don't see the political willpower for that stuff to happen yet. I, th I think it will happen after months or years of, of deep suffering. But I honestly think uh, it's just going to be one crazy dude who completely fucking loses it and says, I don't care anymore. Kill me. You know, go, go after it. But I'm going to fight this thing tooth and nail to the end. And when that person rises up, you know, like I, I hope that we'll see a large surge of people get behind them and that that'll start to be the new nascent base for a political revolution. But at this point, we're, we're still far and away because people are still lapping up the mouthpiece and, and the offerings from, from these governments. Right. Eric, I really enjoyed our talk. Um, do you want to... Um... Give my listeners where uh, where they can find you, your links, your. Yeah, you. so you can follow me on Twitter. I'm just Eric Kaysen, E-R-I-K-C-A-S-O-N on Twitter. And then specifically, you can find a link to Crypto Sovereignty in my profile there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really, Crypto Sovereignty is a project just to explore the deep philosophical and uh, political ideas of what Bitcoin is and the way that it. And not just Bitcoin, but the reason I call it crypto sovereignty is I, I very much believe that cryptography is at the heart of Bitcoin and what allows for it to operate. And I explore deeply a lot of the philosophical ideas of how cryptography animates Bitcoin and allows for it the sort of uh, intransigent, non-human sovereignty that's found at the heart of this technology. But thanks for having me on the show. It's, it's always a pleasure to get to talk with you. And uh, it warms my heart to, to remember that there are other people out here with the same ideas and perspectives. And uh, it, it really helps give me hope for the future because as, as dark as things look right now, I think that there are these shimmering 
gems of light in it that uh, if we can follow them, it will lead the way out of the darkness. Very well said, Eric. Oh, yeah. Let's hope for the best. And um, it just uh, stay healthy, Eric, and uh, your your beloved family. And yeah, hope to have you back soon. Um, yeah, we we need this transition. We need this transformation. It it starts with every individual. Like, uh, and this is this is why I think we need to to do these talks, to do these podcasts, in order to at least you know get them on some kind of angle, uh, some kind of inspirational angle, and so people really find their path their own individual path to you know to their inner whatever desires dreams of freedom you know at the end of the day absolutely absolutely yeah and i i look forward to our next conversation and it would be great to do a panel discussion with some other guys because uh yeah as i said this warms my heart and it, it helps uh quench and rejuvenate me of understanding that uh, the, the work that we're doing is important and that exposing more and more people to the, the ideals and perspectives that we have is really important. Exactly. <laughs> Eric, take care. Peace. Be well, well, my friend. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Ciao. All right. It's always refreshing to talk to Eric Kaysen. Hope you loved it as much as I did. Please give him a follow on Twitter. I'm going to put this all in the show notes. And um, thank you so much to my listeners, to my followers, to subscribers. Retweet, share, love, whatever you do, you, you support me in any shape or form. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. My email address is hello at thetotalconnected.com. Still looking for an ethical Bitcoin sponsor. So please get in touch with me. And yeah, um, you know, we need a real um, uh, transformation. We need a real evolution. And that starts, you know, with. Uh, with within the communities within every each and every individual and um yeah yeah you know with the hearts and scars is money and that is bitcoin with decentralization with open source technologies with new soil new healthy soil uh new structures um where you know each and everyone uh you know must not fear to express our you know our our opinions, our thoughts, our our desires, and to really have a, f a free entrepreneur, free market uh, system, where each and every one you know uh, blossoms uh, to the utmost, um, and that is only possible with starts with the root of the money, and that is Bitcoin, because it's um, yeah, it's the money we've been waiting for. This is why we need to start with the money. It's not going to fix all and everything but it will but it will it, it is already you know uh, preparing this the, the structures the foundations the, the the society our human civilization for for totally uh, unimaginable uh, civilization where we can thrive you know in in freedom and prosperity and joy and pleasure and and you know, evolution of, of, of social structures, evolution of science, evolution of technologies um, and spirituality, you know, and because uh, the question is, why are we doing this? Why Bitcoin? Why freedom? You know, why, why do we need this? Because the way it's, it's going right now, the events and things are unfolding right now at an exponential rate of speed. This is not good. This is going to lead to tyranny, to dictatorship, to Orwellian nightmare, to, you know, and it's, and it's already here. I mean, look at China, look at, look at every other country, uh, uh, social credit system or total surveillance uh, things going on. So uh, this is not good. This is, um, you know, we need, we, need, we need to speak up. We need to be conscious, be aware of what's going on. We need to understand, comprehend the essence, the causes of, of this reality, and then, you know, go into human action. All right. My name is Kevin Navani. I'm the Total Connector. This was another Total Bitcoin podcast show. Thank you so much for listening, watching, and take care of yourself. Bye. Mm -hmm.